The Tesla bot, which is a humanoid robot designed to automate dangerous, repetitive, and boring tasks, is coming sooner than you think. With Tesla's advances in robotics and artificial intelligence, the technology needed to build the Tesla bot is already available. And the most recent video Elon Musk showed at the Investors Day event shows that the bots are much more advanced than most realize. In this video, you will meet a robotics expert who believes that Tesla will already have 500 Tesla bots before the end of this year, and they will already be useful in the factories. The bots will have many, many use cases, and we will review this list. He will also review each and every part of the bot, how they are made, how they work, and what he thinks they can do. The Tesla bot is powered by the same technology that powers our electric cars. With a sophisticated system of sensors, cameras, and AI, it can see and understand its environment and it can learn from its experiences. What makes this possible is Tesla's neural network, real-world AI. By analyzing large amounts of data, the robots can be trained to perform complex tasks and adapt to new environments. This allows the Tesla bot to perform tasks that would be difficult to automate using traditional programming. Another important technology is the development of advanced sensors and cameras. These sensors allow the bot to navigate and interact with its environment avoiding obstacles and recognizing objects. The bot's humanoid form factor allows it to perform tasks that require dexterity and mobility, such as opening doors and carrying objects. Its advanced AI and natural language processing capabilities allow it to communicate with humans and understand commands. The Tesla bot is set to transform many industries. Manufacturing and assembly lines will be automated. Construction and other physically demanding industries will benefit. The healthcare industry can use the Tesla bot to assist with patient care and reduce the workload on healthcare workers. The robot's tireless nature and ability to work without breaks or fatigue make it ideal for an untold number of tasks. The Tesla bot clearly represents the future of robotics, a future where robots are not just tools, but partners, a future where robots work alongside humans to create a better world. Today, we are talking with a well-known robotics expert in the Tesla community, Scott Walter. Welcome, Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Herbert, and uh, happy Pi Day. Happy Pi Day. Thank you so much, Scott. So Scott is an aerospace engineer with a PhD in mechanical engineering. He co-founded Deneb Robotics, which was a pioneer in the early days of robot work cell layout planning, robot simulation, and robot offline programming, where Scott's work in collision detection was vital to robot path planning. Scott also helped develop the standard for connecting robot simulation tools to virtual robot controllers. After selling Deneb Robotics, he co-founded Visual Components that made full factory and robot simulation accessible to engineers. Scott has worked on projects for NASA, aerospace and defense, heavy equipment, shipbuilding, automotive, automotive, robot vendors, and systems integrators. Scott also has a very cool YouTube channel called Going Ballistic Motion. I bet it's got something to do with robots, right, Scott? So yeah, Scott, something with I'm, robots and something with space. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that after our talk today, I'm going to get so much brighter about robots and the coming Tesla bot. Yes. Okay. Glad glad to be here. And the one thing I want to point out is I was a co-founder, so there's a lot of other colleagues that were, you know, around me that helped put these things together. So I don't get all the credit. They deserve a lot too. Absolutely. One of the greatest videos, the funny, the interesting videos that I saw from your mm -hmm. website that I want to start off with was this one. And it's kind of cool because uh, <laughs> you created this, I think, right as soon as you heard about the Tesla bot. Uh, can you tell me a little bit mm -hmm. what's happening here? Well, uh, when everyone was thinking about what is Optimus going to be able to do on the factory floor, they were imagining all these very complex and very difficult tasks. And I said, let's look at the low hanging fruit first. And these are like really simple tasks that go in kind of the repetitive and boring. And they're also extremely achievable. So I could see that as being one of the first applications. And so that's my prediction. And today I'm going to go through and explain why. I think this is the case. I think we we have a lot of data to back it up. Okay. Now, the other thing that I want to start off with is that mm -hmm. you said something that's pretty, <laughs> pretty shocking. You told me that you believe that today, that by the end of this year, there's going to be 500 bots 
uh, Tesla bots and that they're already going to be starting in the factory. This is completely opposite of what many have people have been saying that it's going to take years. Don't expect the Tesla bot is going to be a business that's going to be available right away. Why did you believe this? Um, I'll use just three letters, FSD. We know how FSD works. It's the fleet. It's the mileage, right? You, you need the data. And in order for Optimus to be able to progress, you need a lot of data. You just can't have one Optima. You have to have a lot doing that. And I'm not alone on this. Of course, Randy Kirk, he's maybe a little bit more to one side. He's more up around the thousand. Um, and even uh, Joe Minaretto also said it has the same feeling that, you know, you need at least a hundred bots, if not more. So I'm like hedging my bets between the two. It's going to be more than a hundred, maybe less than a thousand, something like that. But you need a significant number to be able to get enough data on the operations of the robots, how to do it. Now, another thing which may be shocking is when I saw this, I, I put out a tweet and saying that I want to reserve the first Tesla car to come off the line that had like anything built with Optimus. And I'm afraid I might be too late, not because someone else reserved it, but it might already be out there. What? It could be. I mean, there are so many operations. We may not know it. It could just be something simple. that just loaded a part into a machine and something happened. It took it off and that ended up becoming part of the car. So we may already have Tesla vehicles out there that have been built with Optimus. Um, it's possible. It's quite possible. Why not? Well, it's, everything's possible, but it's a shocking that you think that we'd already have 500 today. And I think part of why well, you're saying maybe this- Maybe not 500 today, by the end of the year, but the the we year. definitely know we have, from that video, we can see that we already have at least three in that image, but I'm sure there's a bit more. So, you know, it's probably more than 10 now. And it's a question of whether they reached 100 and by the end of the year, they could have 500. And I could be wrong. It could be 1,000. So <laughs> I, I, if, if I'm wrong, I think I'm wrong on the, on, on the low side, not on the high side. Wow. Okay. And we will show parts of that video later. And we're going to go yes. through each of the little uh, components of the robot. And you're going to tell me why you think that that wasn't just a video. You think it's actually real. and that Oh, they it's, were real. Actually it's real. It's real. It's <laughs> real. It's absolutely okay. real. It's Let's get started with reminding everybody the history of when did uh, Tesla announce right. the bot? What happened? Um, mm -hmm. Tell me what you saw. Yeah. So uh, do you remember the the invite that went out there? And I think it was this one right here. So I had to put that up there because I couldn't remember myself. It seems like it's way, way back there, but it hasn't even been two years yet. And at, at, uh, at this point, if you remember on that day, the, the slide that Elon showed uh, introducing the bot, uh, at that point, all Optimus was, was a PowerPoint, nothing more mm -hmm. than that, with specs. Mm -hmm. So we weren't able to see anything else. And of course, you couldn't tell very much from this slide. It's the next slide that really excited me because then I looked at that and I was able to say, th those are the details. And because the first question in my mind was like, oh, how many, how many servos, how many actuators do they have in there? And I wanted to know, because a lot of times in the human body, when you think about it, you, you might have a pretty high number. It might, might be 60, 80, 100, something like that. So I wanted to know, and of course I looked at it, I started counting everything to try to figure it out, only to realize if I looked a little bit more to the right, the numbers were right there. <laughs> so I wanted to know <laughs> how many in the arms, how many in the legs, everything else. So there's a total of 40 in there, and they're broken wow. down 12 in the arms. That doesn't mean 12 in each arm, that means six in each. So the total is six, and the same with the hands. And then you've got the torso and the legs and everything else. And uh, from my background in, in robotics and ki in, in kinematics, it's rather interesting to figure out how they were going to allocate those different actuators to do different different tasks. So for example, let's look quickly at the hands. You know, that it's broken into six in the hands, right? So that means you've got six motors in each hand, but you're like, well, wait a minute, I've, I've got five fingers, what's going on? Well, one for each finger, two for the thumb. That's pretty clear. However, and when we get into the hands, we're gonna find out our hands actually have more degrees of freedom than that. So <laughs> we, we come in here and one of the first things that we had to do is I had to figure out what was going on the, on the arm. And, and John and I had a big discussion about it. My prediction was that if you just go back that that one slide, we'll see for a second, that for the arm, we have uh, basically six degrees of freedom for the arm. And that's standard for a lot of industrial robots that you have six motors there. But the way they do it is they have two in the shoulder, uh -huh. they have one on the elbow, and they have three at the wrist. But in this case, they have three at the shoulder, one here. And I said, well, wait a minute, that means they're only going to have two at the wrist, which means uh -huh. you're losing a little bit of wrist motion out there. And if you look at your hand, you can do this. This is what we call a roll. Uh -huh. And you can do this, this is what we call a pitch. And you can uh -huh. do this, which we call a yaw. And so I said, well, 
they have to take one of those out, they're going to take out the yaw because it's the oh. one you use the least. And when you do use this, you get something called metacarpal. You know, it's it's the one oh. that kind of hurts the most to move in. So it's almost like, ah, you don't need it. But again, they decided to, to have the extra degree of freedom back there because that's how the human arm works. The human arm is really seven degrees of freedom. And wow. an industrial robot, they take one of them away because mathematically you only need six. So that was my feeling and how it was going to work. And then we go to that next slide there. I was predicting confidently there's going to only be six there. And this comes out an AI day uh, or it comes out announcing AI day. I think this was right during the, uh, the shareholder meeting. And I'm looking at that. I was like, oh, I'm wrong. They actually are going to have all the degrees of freedom. Now, everyone was looking at the fingers. Like, is it three fingers? And why is there a door hinge there for the thumb and all this stuff? And I'm looking at the wrist, trying to figure out how that mechanism works. And then I realized they're going to do it too. And wow. so if you jump to the next slide, I think, you know, I do a close up in there to look at it and you see you, you have these two drive units or oh, like pistons gotcha. that are coming out and yeah. you notice how it's kind of askew a little bit. That was mm -hmm. kind of the, the, the clue to tell me how that was going to work. And it's, it's an ingenious mechanism that they have here. So we jump ahead to the next slide and that's where I put together. Okay. Then I started to look at what was going on. So I took that slide from the, the first AI day, turned around and looked in really closely because they, they had kind of this skeleton in there that you weren't sure, was that just a graphic artist having a lot of liberties? And it right. turns out, no, they really, they really thought this through. It wasn't something that they just put up there. It's m way more than a PowerPoint. They clearly knew what they were doing and that there was a lot of information in there. And I keep having to go back to realize that they gave me another breadcrumb that I missed. So in mm -hmm. here, you can kind of see, and, you, in, and I highlight it in the next slide, that I highlight over that there's these two connecting rods and there's what appears to be those two servos that rotate. And you might wonder, well, well how does that work? And then I show it in the next one um, oh. where I made a little video to show how the oh. mechanism works. Gotcha, gotcha. All right? Yeah. So now yeah. what you have is, if, is, as we run this video, you're going to see how we get that pitch motion. And then and the, the blue is doing the roll. You know, that's like opening and closing your door. And then when the, um, the red motors move, when they move together, you get the pitching motion of your wrist going up and down. And when they go the opposite direction, you end up getting the yawing. And then you can do a combination of the two of them to get that to work. And that's what they call a parallel mechanism. And that is ingenious because a lot of times people are making things a serial joint and it gets right. really hard to throw in the yaw. And most people will say, well, is it worth that yaw because the mechanism gets too complicated? Well, this is kind of, you know, killing two birds with one stone. It, it really is one of those that it solved a bunch of problems elegantly. And we'll see it did a little bit more. So I was really happy to see that. And then the next slide comes out. Right, wait, before that, we move off, yeah, stuff, yep, I yep. Mean, you took those two slides, which first of all, yes. I think I have to make the comment that, um, you know, they could have just, uh, like you said, an, a graphic designer created that. Many people did not think yes. that, that that heart guy that was going to be real. And then many thought, you know, even just that image of the um, that they showed with the the number of actuators. But you were able to take that and come up with this. Mm -hmm. How, I mean, are you overextending your guess here, or this is pretty well? You're pretty sure because of the bread comes. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. So at that wow. point, it was pretty clear, and that yeah. the things they put in there was as a result of their design. So they had some pretty good ideas on how they wanted it to work. That's great. And okay. then the actual inv invite comes out. And yes. then on the invite, and I highlighted what was on there, that we get a better view of the wrist. And then I realized, oh, I was a little bit wrong because they mm -hmm. made a little bit of a modification there that mm -hmm. you can see where the big, uh, where the, the, the purple arrow is way to the left. That is the servo that's using, that's doing the rolling, that's allowing your whole mm -hmm. wrist to move this way. And then yeah. they have closer to the wrist, these two little servo drives that go in and out. So they, they changed it up a little bit. And I could see the pivot point that's there. The part that he circles, like, aha, that's the pivot point and where they are. That was the clue of what the mechanism actually looked like. So after seeing that one, then I revised my design and said, this is what they're going with. Oh. It looks like this now. So, okay. so that one will sort of show the same thing. So rather than having those big blue servos turning around there, they then went with a linear actuator to do it instead. <laughs> it's a bit how more compact you, and it's a bit better. And we're going to see that. How did you so create this is the, these graphics? Yeah, this is great. Um, this is what our software does. This is what I do every day. Oh. I'm working. This is our software package. It's a visual component software package. It does this for robotics. And so we have a modeling tool that just allows me to come in and create kinematics like this and test it out and make sure it's working. So yeah, my hobby is my day job sometimes. 
or maybe it's the other way around. I'm not sure which. If if you're working for Tesla, can you just nod twice or blink three times or something? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I, I, I really wish. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. Let's keep going. This is great. Oh, my God. Okay. Now, okay. okay. So when Bumblebee first comes out, yeah. Uh, or the, the Tesla bot, uh, you know, just remember it kind of looked like this. And I've got another, a little close up here so we can sort of see how the mechanism looks. And if you look at it right there, you can see that connecting rod uh, pretty clearly. So that's what they were using. Uh, and this is the first iteration. And this is not what they were actually showing on the invite. So it's a little bit different. And then mm -hmm. I think there's another image coming on up here where it's showing, okay. So now if you look at it, you can kind of see where those blue disks were, or the, sorry, the red disks that I had which are the actuators. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the linkage mechanism. You can't quite see, see it there, but if you go to the next slide, you are going to see it highlighted. So mm -hmm. that's where the red is and that's where the green is. So that is how that wrist mechanism as designed. I want you to notice that that linkage is below the wrist right now. Okay, below the and wrist. now the next slide, I want you to see that they kind of like that linkage mechanism because what you're seeing there is how the elbow is actuated. And then the next slide, I sort of highlight how that is, that you can see, again, kind of the, the red disc there. You can see what the connecting rod is, and you can see where the pivot point is on the axis for, for that. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a design that they sort of like, but it's only for one degree of, of rotation, not for two. And so then we start to see it in action. And as we begin to see it in action, so uh, here I'm going to highlight on the next one. If you look really closely, can you find those mechanisms? So it's like a where's Waldo right now. So I've got those highlighted. You can see the rotations and you can see the mechanism and you can see it's kind of low. And the other thing you can see on this, I was right, even though I was wrong, it was mm -hmm. six axes at first. They, mm -hmm. they did not have the yaw there. So that wrist could only do the roll and it can only do the pitch. There was no yaw in there. Mm -hmm. And now they learned from this experience of actually using it on the floor. So we can see again, what's going on here in the next slide. Okay, there's another close up just so you really see what's going on there. And I don't like how bulky that is. It's like, ah, that's just yeah. this asking for trouble. It's just going to get in the way of your work and everything else. You want to clean it up and, and make a better design. And they came up with a better idea. And when, when they came up with a better, somebody's like, you know what? If we just do this little modification, we can get the yaw. You can, I bet that's what came out. They cleaned it up and then realized we could get one more thing out of it. Wait, where, where are you getting these images? This one here and this one here. Oh, that was right from um, the release from AI Day Two when they, they showed Optimus, because this is where they were showing the um, what it was seeing, and and oh. how their their navigation. So that was one of the slides. And then you might remember from the next. I think the next picture is actually showing Optimus doing this task. Now look very closely. I want to ask everyone in your audience: yeah. Does that look like a laboratory environment? It does not. It's a factory. <laughs> But, but uh, you know, I mean, production, it looks yes. like it's late at night. There's no one around there. They made sure no one could see, but they are testing this on the floor already. Do you see what's going on there? That is an actual production operation that has to be done. But it, I, I guess, you know, I mean, those parts are real parts that there's coming out of that machine and Optimus yeah. has picked it up and put that on the red tray. And then that's been used somewhere else. And it has ended up in a Tesla. I'm telling you, there are already cars on the road okay, where well, one of the process steps was done by Optimus. Let's pause for a second because, you know, when I saw this, first of all, this was very early on. And so we very saw early. the bot that couldn't even really move very much. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're assuming that they're really just very early, literally just what, six months that they had a chance. Yeah. They said that it took them six months yeah. to get to where they were. But yeah. what was what's changing my mind a little bit is how you were showing that even just the images of every image, whether it's a video, whether it's a, a PowerPoint, it is it turns into the reality. So they're not, they weren't yes. just, you know, making it up and pretending this is what we're gonna build. It it was already a PowerPoint. And mm -hmm. they're very willing to share and very transparent. And that you can even mm -hmm. drill in and magnify and go, this is it. And then you can show me yes. later. So that's the cool and, part. So you, that's And again, you can, you can see where I, I circled where that mechanism is. So you can kind of see on the elbow how they, they have that same kind of linkage mechanism as well as down the wrist. So you can get, get a little bit of an idea. And then the next image, I think, is sort of showing how the hand grip is not perfect there. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, I put that red line in there to show that, oh, you'd like the wrist to be maybe a little bit more parallel to the part. And that's probably as a result of not having the yaw to, to allow you to just kind of move that wrist around there. Just to give it, you don't have much yaw. But sometimes it's just enough to get the trick done. So they might have said, hmm, we, we've got to get it back in there somehow. So they, they went ahead and made that decision and, and then redesigned it and rethought the whole process Okay, sure along, <laughs> along the way. But again, I mean, look at that. That is not a laboratory. That is Fremont sure, probably it's, 3 it's, a.m. when there's no one else around there with cell phones or anything else to take any pictures. Yeah, it was. I mean, the reason I say this is because we all know, we've all seen the Boston Dynamics uh, parkour mm-hmm. and it's jumping everywhere. And it's very, very, very impressive. But then you, you know, they show the behind the scenes and they had to do what, I don't know, 20, 30 runs at mm-hmm, this. Mm-hmm. And then every time it fell, they just clip, clipped that out until they got the best shots to kind of show the whole thing as if it did it all in one. And of course it didn't. Yes. And that's, you know, yes. when you do a video like this, it could just have been kind of like a, a staged setup and you're, you're seeing this, but you truly believe that this is really working. This is, you know, they're going out and testing it in the field. They need to find out what it can and cannot do. And it just turns out the operations are not in the lab. They actually decided to do it in something, an operation on the floor to see if it was effective. Now, maybe it wasn't doing it as fast as the human operator. You know, maybe it wasn't quite able to catch up or maybe it was, you know, because it may be that that step doesn't have a, a, a really short cycle time. So it's very easy for it to do it. But again, if just one of those pieces made it into a car, you, you want to find out which VIN it's in. Let me tell you. <laughs> find out you want the to VIN. find out the very first one. That would yes, be historic. Yes, you want, to, you want to demand. I want to know. I want to know which one because this car is going to be collectible. Yeah. Another pause here. I mean, you've been in the robotics industry for decades, and we call mm-hmm. these, fact, these uh, robots in the factory robots. The yes. difference between them is that they are massive uh, mm-hmm. machines. And they're robotic, but really what they do is they grab something and they move it somewhere else. And it's got to be very, very precise. It can only be if that thing is exactly yes, what yes. it is and they grab it exactly. and they move it. This is the very first kind of, first of all, humanoid form factor and the ability to using vision to know yes. if something's slightly off, it can still figure out where to grab it. And then, you know, mm-hmm. put it wherever it needs to go. And it doesn't have to be the exact same spot. Like, like the other kind of robots need to be, right? It's got to be precisely in the same spot. So, I mean, you know what I mean? Like there are cars made by robots today, but you yes, believe yes. that this is still historic. With very precise um, operations going on, but this is very different. And that the whole idea is Optimus is going to be doing a lot of the processes to do not require high precision. Yeah. But that's okay. still a task that has to be done. And we're going to see why as, as we go on here. So, uh, just, yeah, okay. let's see. What do I have next here? Okay, good. So it's good. that was a good segue because now we can go into the, the hand design itself Beautiful. and what was going on there. And I think I've mentioned that the real key to a humanoid robot is like, you know, walking is hard. And I, I, I agree with Joe Munaretto that what's hard about a, a walking robot, a humanoid robot is not the walking, but walking with a load doing a, a process because that's going to throw you off. So that, that's the biggest challenge there. But we've already solved the, we can make a robot walk. And there are nice hand designs out there, but I've, I've said there's like this Fermi paradox of hands. If there's so many great robotic <laughs> hands out there, why, where are they? <laughs> you, don't, you don't see them anywhere. So they seem to work really well in the lab, but you know, why haven't they come out? Right. And so the, the big thing is like, you need a really good hand and you need the brains to go with it. And okay. once you get both of those things together, then you can do a lot of things. Now, okay. this is not the be all and end all of hand designs. Mm-hmm. It's an adequate design. It's good enough to get going. So the whole Tesla bot idea was they got rid of all the parts and processes and brought it down to the minimum viable product because <laughs> that's the philosophy at Tesla is right. that remember, throw everything away and then start putting them back in when you realize, oh, maybe we need this. So again, that's the design philosophy. Okay. And now we can take a look at exactly what they've done with the hand. So we have the human hand and and we have the the Tesla bot hand. And and what are some of the things they've done? So the first thing to understand is, you know, the terminology of the bones that we have in our hand and how they correspond to what we're going to see in in the Tesla bot hand. And so you you have down at your wrist that, you know, the carpals, the metacarpals are basically the bones that make up your palm. And then your actual finger bones are the the proximal, the intermediate and and the distal. 
And they're kind of color coded here. So when we go to the next slide, we're going to see how they sort of map to what's on the hand. Now, nice. the first thing to notice is like all their fingers are different length, but the Tesla bot fingers are all the same length. They did not change the lengths. Mm -hmm. And they do that. So they just have one part number for each one of those. They, they don't have to worry mm -hmm. about having different sizes. However, they manage to get kind of that arcing by moving, by making sure it's not a straight line. So that's why I, I'm showing down uh, where you, the palm is that you, yeah you have an offset there to make sure that, you know, you're, well, <clears throat> the middle finger is a little bit longer than the others, uh, even though they're all the same length. Now they did something else is they fused some bones together. So the distal and intermediate phalanges are basically one. So you see where I, I have the, the red and the blue in there, that's one. Yeah. But what they did is they lengthened the proximal a little bit and kind of shortened the others. So they simplified the hand design to the absolute bare minimum of what you need. And where you see the metacarpals, those aren't the bones. Those there are actually the servos that move it. And they're doing it with tendons to be able to move everything. And then for the thumb, you have two drives to be able, because the thumb has two, two degrees of freedom, two ways of moving. Now with the hands, we <laughs> actually have probably, you know, more than 11 degrees of freedom in our hands. Wow. Because we can certainly see that my fingers have a lot of joints that can bend, yet there's only one motor that's there. And so um, there's only one drive, yet the hand has the ability to rotate about more than one pinned axis here. And we're going to see sort of how that plays as, as we go along. So they, they pull along a tendon. And I think on the next slide, I probably show something here if, if I remember. Okay, this is what I want you to see is that all the tendon can do is that when it gets pulled on, it's in tension. And in tension, it will cause your hand to clasp. And then you release it, the tension, and then it's gonna open up. But uh, tendons or cables work really well in tension, but they don't do anything in compression. In order to get them to work in compression, they have to be sheathed and everything else. So if you think of like your bicycle and the brakes on your bicycle, they really work well in one direction, but not so well in the other. So it's when it's in tension that your brakes work, but you do the compression, it's a bit hard. And the reason why your brake pedals or your brake pads are able to open up is because it has a spring on it to make sure it opens up. It's not because the cable is going in the opposite direction. So the same thing is happening here at each knuckle. If you look in really closely and it's, it's a little hard, but uh, you know, anyone who goes back where we've got the red circles there, you're going to see that there's a, a torsion spring there. Yeah. So when you take the tension off, it's just going to pop open on its own. Gotcha. So that means there's yeah. a lot of clenching force but there's not a whole lot of force when it comes to open. Yes. So it will clench, but it won't open. And then the other, the big red circle I have there, just to remind us that, you know, that design there of the wiring, it's still it, it, prototype in the lab. You know, that's not what it's going to look like in the end. So you can tell you that they're still building these things by hand because it's not sheathed very well at, at the back. The harnessing is not done. So that's all going to get cleaned up eventually. So that's, okay. that's pretty much yeah. what the reminder of that is. Well, first of all, what you're talking about is, is this, is this the video that they showed that they're actually building yes. a Tesla bot? Building it. So yes, exactly. So you're talking exactly. about this, this part here with the sheathing. That is a Tesla bot. That This is going to be a That's wire. a Tesla bot go. building a bot. Yes. Yes. This is, what is Putting this? It the legs? Together. What is this? And, and that's, that's actually the arm. So that is the, yeah. I think it's the right arm that they're going to put on. And so they're showing that they can grab a, a cable and kind of pull it out. <laughs> um, and we're convinced it's real. It's a little bit staged in that it probably wasn't clipped in there. So it could, because yeah. first of all, that's not how you remove a cable. Yes. You're never unplug any cable right. from the middle. That's you right. actually go to the plug right. itself and pull it out. All right. That's so we right. know there was absolutely no tension force on the other end to do it. But the whole idea was it had to figure out and it was looking at it and then even changing its trajectory. When you look at it, you see it's kind of going one way and it changes a little bit. So, oh, wait a minute. I want to grab it over here. So you can almost see that it was thinking and was able to do that. And there's some continuity issues in how it was shot, you know, from the editing. You can see, oh, there's many takes here because the continuity between one scene and another is not quite there. But still, Tesla bot is doing all that stuff. I'm going to play no the CGI video. No CGI whatsoever. Yes. I'll play the video yes. uh, so people can okay. see it as we're talking here. Um, but how does the how does the uh, robot know the because it doesn't have feeling right pro CF pro CF right stuff. right how, how does yeah, it know how, CF, yeah. how 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 strong to grab that cable and to stop? Okay, so this has been a topic of discussion, and there seems to be enough people that agree. That, and even the Artemis robot, Dennis Hong from UCLA Labs uh, from Romello, um, said that they are also using the back feed on the motors to be able to, to sense what's going Sorry. on. So you have encoders in the motors, so that will tell you where where your arm is, okay? Yes. And yeah. 
so a, a little trigonometry lesson here is like, you know, imagine that, well, let me just get over here, that this yeah. arm is like three units long and this is four units long. And I have some sort of servo that's pushing this out kind of like that, okay? And if the length of my servo, I'm able to measure how long that is. And if it's five, can you tell me what this angle here is? I sure. think you can. It's yes. a three, four, five triangle, right? Yeah. And so that's the whole idea with a little bit of trigonometry. If you know what the length of your hypotenuse is, you can calculate what that angle is just because this is a known length, that's a known length. So even if you're not measuring directly here, if you know exactly what your motor is doing, you can tell where that is. So that tells you position, but it doesn't tell you velocity or anything else. However, if I have like, I know I require so much torque to hold my arm up like this, and it's like more than I'm expecting, that tells me there's a load on there. And so that's what they're doing is that, yeah, they go to grab, they know it's going to be this easy. Yep. And suddenly the current to do that goes up. And as that current goes up, it tells you a lot about what the clenching force is. And the thing is, there is a lot of, it seems like there's a lot of noise in there, but there's a ton of information. And then if you use this thing called calculus, you can extract a lot of this stuff. And uh, it's amazing the information that's, that's there, but it's very hard for us to tease it out. But a neural network, you train it enough times, it's going to yeah. look at that noise and it's going to figure out exactly what that is. It's going to look at the noise and say that, okay, I'm clenching and now I'm clenching on this. And from that noise, it's going to be able to tell, oh, this feels like a plastic water bottle you know that's what it feels and it feels full to me it will just be able to kind of tell and then you know the next time you come over and you you get the empty yeah. one it's going to yeah. notice that and of course it's then going to tie that into what it sees it says i see something that looks like a plastic bottle i'm expecting this if it's not what i'm expecting then we're going to think something a bit different but you, so you think it doesn't you, need to have the sensitivity like our fingers have um, for it to be able to function or a lot Maybe of the, it, eventually for certain things it will but we don't, and that's the whole thing. What they're trying to do right now is it's like, let's see how much we can get away with, with as little as possible. Yeah. You know, what's in there? Let's, let's not try to over-engineer this whole thing. Let's like really minimize it and see what we can do with software. And if we have to start putting a sensor in here and there, we can do it. So there are some things it won't be able to do right away because it doesn't have, but it doesn't mean there's, there's not, aren't tasks that it can't do. And there's a lot. And the main thing it just needs to know is have I grabbed this thing or not? And does it feel stable? Does it, is something happening? I'm getting the sense that it's slipping out because mm -hmm. there's some weird things going on. It'll be able to tease that out and tell really quite well. And, and that's the whole beauty of machine learning and neural networks. And part of the reason why we need to have a little bit more than 10. Gotcha. Okay. Why we so got to start getting up there. Yes. Because we can, we can do this in a simulator. We can do this in the physics to get an idea but the real world in the simulation is so much different. And we'll, I work in simulation all the time. And, yeah. you know, I'm showing customers their layouts and stuff like that. And a lot of times they go, oh, wow, our layout's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. It's like, these assumptions are in there. You know, we're yeah. pretty confident it can, but you got to remember there are all these other real world scenarios you better take yeah. into account. So you, right now they can only do so much with simulation. They need the data. Gotcha. Makes sense. Let's keep going. Yeah. That's good answer. So let's... Uh... This is just now. Continue. This is what I want you to see. There is yeah. is look at that. It looks like it's playing, you know, the violin or something there with with the hand over on what is it, the left hand, and see that's what I want you to see. Is this is the problem? Is that if you take your hand and you close it, this is your clenching motion. All your fingers move together, and if I concentrate really, really hard, I might be able to kind of move one of the knuckles without the other, but it's a strain to kind of do that. I mean, naturally your finger just wants to curl up. If you want to stop it from curling, it's kind of hard. And that's uh -huh. the same thing with Optimus. When you go and close it, it wants to do that. Now what's happened here is it's coming down and it's trying to do this with its finger and it runs into something like this, which causes it to do that uh -huh. instead to get uh -huh. a different shape. So what happened is when it went to clench its finger over there, you can see yeah. one of them isn't resting on anything, which is why it's taking that funny position. It's not because they have that kind of fine control. Now, Optimus has no idea that its finger is in that position. It doesn't have the proprioception to be able to do that. It just knows that I've, I've, I've got this much force in that finger, but it can't tell you whether it's kind of straight out, whether it's a little bit crooked or whether it's bent like that. Now, it may be that if it looks at it, it starts associating that feeling in that finger with this kind of object with it looking like that. So, and that's what we kind of were able to do. 
is that we, through our life experience, are able to kind of pick that up between what we see and what we feel that we can then close our eyes and do all these things without even having to see it because we know what it's supposed to feel like. You, you see so much in this one snapshot of a video and you studied it so clearly. What I see is this is a, this is the Tesla bot here, but look at it as the angle of his arm uh, where mm -hmm. it can go up like that and it can bend the wrist, like you said, and then yes. you can bend even further down. So that gives it, you know, this uh, ability to, um, if you can bend your arm like this and not just always do, you know, straight arm things, mm -hmm. uh, it gives you a lot more flexibility to do now all in, sorts of more movement, right? Yeah. Now in and the video, here, I made some sort of decision about where to grab that arm. In one case, I said, oh, over on the left side, I want to come underneath because uh -huh. it's more stable there. But notice the other one's coming from the top. And why is it coming yes. from the top? It noticed it has a hand grip there. It, it, it noticed there's a really good place to be able to grab it right there. And it didn't care. Now, for you and me, doing this with our hands, you know, having them kind of opposite like this, yeah, kind of hurts yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But Tesla Bot could care less. This yes. and that has the same sensation to it. It's not like one of them is more comfortable than the other. They're the same comfort level. Yeah. Tell me about that. Because I saw in one of your other videos, you said that um, you were pretty impressed mm -hmm. that the bot can do this, this movement. Yes, I just... yes. Now, our, our hands do not have that much range as possible. The most important we have is this roll that we, we can take our hand and this is what you usually do to open and close a door now. And we have almost plus or minus 180. I mean, some people might be able to do it, but if you put your palm this way right. and then right. try to come all the way back, it's, it's, a, it's a stretch, you know, it's literally. It's a bit hard. So we, it's, it's, we could say plus or minus 180. But then if you look at, at the pitch, I mean, it's important motion, but still it's not a whole lot. Now, right. an industrial robot can do like plus or minus 360 here. It wow. can do about plus or minus 150. We can't even come close. And then, well, it doesn't actually, it has a different axis for doing the yaw, but it, it can go a lot more. The yaw, you're like plus or minus 30 on a good day. It's not much there, uh -huh. but it can be enough. Now, it might have a bit more in the yaw because I'm noticing with everything it's doing, it's taking advantage of that flexibility. It's like, it likes this new degree of freedom. It's like, ah, I love this, you know? <laughs> it's just so much easier for me to grab things. And so it was a very good decision that they decided to go ahead and add the yaw to the wrist because it will make it doing operations like this a lot easier. And But you were, just to complete the thought, you did say that it can do a whole 360 like this, right? It looks like plus, yes, plus or minus 180. So it's not trying to do more than, it's not trying to be superhuman. You know, like okay. say an industrial robot could do plus or minus 360. This looks like they want to do plus or minus 180 because okay. they want to say, well, we still want it to be kind of human-like and, yeah. and not give it these capabilities that aren't there because my suspicion is mm -hmm. you want to make sure operations that Tesla bot does will be used to kind of look at the ergonomics to improve a process. So when the humans are doing it, it's safer for the humans and easier for the humans too. That's the other application that people don't realize. It's going to make humans jobs easier because they're going to find ways that are better for the human, ergonomically better. Okay. Uh, just since we're looking at this photo, I'm looking at the head and is it just going to have two eyes or why wouldn't you add more eyes? Uh, but they want it to be as human like as possible. It's, why need three if a human can live with two? It probably has definitely way more than two. It's okay. both How predator you know and prey. How do, you know these things? How do you make these statements like that with such confidence? <laughs> because John Gibbs told me, okay, he, he was He's able smart. to see it. So, so he's seen enough. And so we're, we're kind of joking that it's both predator and prey because it has the eyes here and it also has the yes. eyes on the side. So it, it, it has that peripheral vision. And this is going to become very important as, as we start to go down the list of, uh, of the robot because think about it. They had to add one more servo drive to get th that arm. So the okay. arm is now seven degrees of freedom. Yeah, that's okay. And, and, and we'll, get back to, we'll get back to that in, in a little bit on yeah. um, some of the decisions they, they've been making and what's going on with the head. Okay, so here we are able to see that it's able to pick up a tool designed for humans. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the whole idea is it's going to go in to work cells that are manual already and there are not going to be any special tooling. So believe it or not, cars used to be built completely manually. There were no robots. 
So uh, a lot of spot welding guns and stuff like that were designed to be manually operated. Then when the robots came along, they redesigned the spot welding guns for the robots. And guess what? Those spot welding guns, you cannot use manually. So, I mean, they're all in. It's like those robots are better work because if that cell breaks down, there's no humans running on in there and taking them off the, the robots and using them. So you want to make sure it's interchangeable. And the next slide, you'll kind of see an idea. Here's a drill designed for humans. That's a drill designed for a robot. Yes. Okay. Do you think any human's going to pick that up? And look <laughs> at the end of the robot. If you look at the orange robot, that black circle in the end is what they call the mounting plate, which has a hole pattern in there that allows you to attach your end of arm tooling rigidly on there. Very hard to take off. Mm -hmm. That doesn't like, like, look like a human hand. It doesn't look like I could quickly pick up your, your Black & Decker and do something. So the whole idea is to avoid that situation where we end up having a cell designed for robots that humans cannot go into. They're going to be interchangeable both ways. Optimus can take over, the human can take over. So we need to make sure it's able to deal with human tools. And that's what we are seeing in that example. Yeah, and so that. then I think on the next slide there, you know, we, we are seeing again, um, the, the grip we're seeing, uh, I'm circling that because, I mean, looking the yaw at the wrist, it's like, it's really using it. Like I say, it's taking it for a test drive. Um, and it has picked up, you know, it has enough to be able to pick up the bolt to put in there. But I think there's still going to be some work because when you automate a cell and you have bolts coming into a cell for a, an industrial robot to pick up nowadays, you need to corral all those bolts because normally they come in as a literally a big bucket of bolts and you put them in a bowl feeder that does this thing that literally defies the second law of thermodynamics. It takes all this chaos and it turns it into order. And right. you'll see these things are vibrating and you'll see these things come up and only the, they're just marching on out. And you're looking at that, like there's something wrong here. This is going the wrong direction. And you'll see the bolts come around and align themselves and come right on out to the end. So a robot can go and pick it up from the exact spot and go over yes. and do this and do it repeatedly and do it quickly. So they may still need something like Optimus because when it, it picked up that bolt, it was already in that position. A human put that there so it could grab it. Yeah. Now, the way a real human operator would do it is literally you would have a bucket of bolts off to the side, right? And you, without even looking, you could go over with your eyes closed, kind of know where it is, put your hand in there, feel where the bolts are, pick one up and know exactly the orientation the ball is and put it in. You could do that. This is something James Dama has pointed out is the human hand is incredible. You can count the change in your pocket. Yes. You can just go right in there and you know exactly what you have. You can, and Optimus can't do that yet. Okay. So that's why we're saying we have to be very careful about the applications we're thinking to do, but eventually we'll get there. And something Joe Justice pointed out yesterday that I hadn't thought about is that he's talking about cross-threading and that it's going to understand what cross-threading is about. And a lot of times you get that kind of from the feel and from the sound. And I'm wondering, wait a minute, I'm not thinking of this sound, which it might, he, he might be thinking. A lot of times you feel it in your bones, don't you? When something is going wrong, that's the first place you feel it. So yeah. they may have some sort of vibration sensors. They may be considering it. And if you're not, you might want to um, <laughs> put some sort of vibration sensor in the palm of your hand. So when they're doing that, they would get that sense. Now, whether they can pick it up from the back EMF and other vibrations, I don't know. I mean, it could be a be interesting, but I would put something in there to be able to tell that, oh yeah, that feels good. Ooh, that didn't feel good. And anyone who's a craftsman knows mm. sound tells you so much. That's when you know something is going wrong. It just doesn't sound right. Or the vibration is not what you want it to be. So those would be some of the things that they're going to do to make sure that you don't get cross threads and that the operation is perfect every time. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I assumed that it wasn't able to put the bolt in. That was just, uh, this is just no. for show. <laughs> Yeah. If, if they could, they would have shown it. You know, they, they yeah. probably tried it like 10 times and kept on falling off. They're like, but it worked yesterday, you know? And sure. <laughs> so it's like, oh, well, well, that's it. We just go ahead and do it. And again, that's what shows it to be real because, I mean, we, we saw it wasn't there. They didn't do it with computer graphics. It's not quite ready there, but it's doing a lot. It's kind of weird seeing the arms and legs just separate. We have a whole lab full of arms and legs. <clears throat> Worth bearing in mind that uh, when we did AI Day, uh, 
this version of Optimus didn't work, work at all. So the rate of improvement here, I think, is, is quite uh, significant. Um, it's obviously not doing parkour, uh, but uh, it is walking around, and we have multiple, multiple uh, copies, I suppose, of Optimus. Um, the thing that I think Tesla brings to the table that others don't have is that we have um, we have the uh, real world AI. We're, we're the most advanced in real world AI. So the same AI that drives the car, uh, it, which you can think of the car really as a robot on wheels, and this is a robot on legs. Yeah. Okay, and then this is a bot, right? He's drilling into what is a he's, shoulder or he's, hip? Yes, he's put. That's the shoulder. So he's putting the arm that was walked over by the mm -hmm. other Optimus. So you you have the the two Optimus robots that are walking around, and the one that's on kind of the operating table, having this put on. And again, I want to thank you, Herbert, because over the weekend when I was putting this together, I discovered something mm -hmm. that I then said, John, I can't believe we missed this, and that there's a difference between these two which I think is coming up in a slide or two here. We'll, we'll go ahead and see. Um, and what, and what is this? Is this a motherboard here? Are these, these are wires, right? Yes, yes. I mean, at first I was speculating. It's like, oh, I, I hope those aren't blood vessels or something like that, you know, <laughs> some kind of flu. Sure. Those are probably wires, yes. I think those, yeah. I don't think they're, they're anything for cooling or anything like that. They're just, yeah. um, they, they do look to me like they are just probably connected to the sensors and the computer system. Yep, so that's, that's the normal harnessing that's in there. And now, uh, yes, so we look at this in the, the family portrait, and uh, we have what I, I've now kind of called the, the robot on the table, uh, Steve Optimus, for a reason. Okay. It's kind of a, a right. joke on Steve Austin, yes. because they've decided to build him better, stronger, faster. And there's a difference between the two that are there, that what? are actually walking around, you which we'll see that? in the next slide. What? Yes, the, the difference is, and I think it's in the next slide. The feet. Oh, okay. Look at him walking around. So we're going to look yeah. at uh, look at the feet there. Look at the That's feet. Okay. I think in the next one, I end up showing a contrast between. There we go. Yes. yes. So look at those two pairs of feet. Oh. One of them is extremely flat, and the other one is arched and very different. And they also have what looks like force plate sensors on there. There's a weird hold pattern down by yes. the heel. Yeah. That uh, we, John and I, were trying to figure it out, and then this is called crowd sourcing. <laughs> and then uh -huh. a lot of people in the comments kind of came in and said, "Oh yeah, the, these string gauge sensors, the pattern, everything kind of matches." And also, uh, Joe Mutaretto also has the same feeling that you need to have four sensors there, and uh, to be able to force tell. Sensors. I mean, yeah, how, yeah. How? Well, some you want some sort of sensors, so they have yeah. very few sensors, so they do not have any sensors at you know, a lot of the, the, the following joints that are there, they only have the sensor where the servo is. So you have a lot of degrees of freedom, but you only have these 40 actuators and that's where you get any information. And it's just through, uh, through math that you're sort of figuring out what the configuration of, of what's going on, but you actually don't know what the force is on the ankle directly. You kind of indirectly can infer it, but you don't know for sure. And literally where the rubber meets the road, you need to know what's going on because that's going to help you in your stability. Without it, your control system is going to fail because you're making some sort of assumptions. The one assumption here is that we think this is the way they're going, but they may have found that walking and carrying something at the same time was too hard with these feet that you're going to want to have for better movement in the future. So the walking motion is going to improve a lot when you are able to do a proper toe off. Right now, those feet are so flat, you know, it kind of goes plod, 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 plod. You want more of a rolling motion. And that way, the knees won't be so bent and it won't be down so low. Yeah. It will get a bit, it, so it'll be better for energy efficiency. And it'll be able to walk faster. And, and for that, you need slightly better feet. But the thing is, controlling that maybe was probably too complex at first. And they said, let's take this variable out. Let's just go with like simple feet. We'll just plod along. We want to get a little bit, make some progress. And now, I think they're moving to this. And the reason is these feet have been, been hiding in plain sight all along. Uh -huh. You know, the, remember the pictures of Tesla bot at the Peterson museum that we, that was back when uh, in, in the fall, they had those feet. If, if you look at the, uh, the, the walking evolution, 
it was in the simulation that they did, it has mm-hmm. those feet. So mm-hmm. it's been there and it's actually like almost going back to the original design. And again, that very first slide, and I think I, I show that slide again coming up here or not. I'm trying to remember the yeah, original amazing that you AI this. day one slide. Yep. It feels like an uh, feels like an Easter egg that they was meant for you to catch, but an old yeah, maybe. robot is making a newer version of the robot. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. The older is making a new one, and now I you know I don't work. Okay, so again, we we can kind of look at what's going on in the feet and the evolution here. This yeah. was from one of the the Tesla video that they showed with it basically was a recruiting video for the AI team for uh, for Optimus, and it's a nice close up of the foot where you can see where the ankle is and you see that black cable going in there. Well, we know there's not a servo down there because it's not, there isn't one down there. So that must be probably for some sort of sensor suite that's in there. The other thing, if you look at, at the, uh, what looks like a black gasket that's connecting the two together and you notice how it's circular. If it's mm-hmm. circular, it means there's always the possibility that that can, can pivot. <laughs> if it was square, it won't. Now, I don't think there's a servo there, but what I think there might be is some compliance because the foot does not have the yaw, so it cannot make its toes go in or out. Yeah. But you probably need that yawing motion to get those pivots to work a little bit better. And also, um, my friend uh, Gary Schneider, who's he knows a lot about biomechanics and everything, and he studied this stuff really closely, and he goes on and says that, you do not want to run like Tom Cruise. The worst way to run is like Tom. It looks cool, and, and you think that's the way it should be, <laughs> yeah. And that cause that will cause more injuries than anything else. You want to run like Barry Sanders because Barry Sanders has the most perfect running stride of all time, yeah. which is part of the reason why he was the greatest running back of all time. Yes, I can say that because I live up in Michigan in Detroit, <laughs> um, and he never was injured. And why was he never injured? Because his his running style was so perfect, he didn't stress his joints out. And if you look out there now, a lot of, of athletes are being taught to run more like Tom Cruise and you're getting what are called these non-contact ACL injuries mm-hmm. where they'll just be running and suddenly they'll fall down and, and their knee is out and like, what's going on? It's mm-hmm. because the way that their feet and everything they're being taught to plant on the, on the ground is completely wrong. And so what will happen is if you don't alleviate the torque that's happening down there when you're trying to do that pivot, it's going to manifest itself somewhere else in the structure, like up in the knee. The knee. In, the, yeah. in the knee, you've got a pivot joint like this, right? Well, if you torque it, that means you're putting a little bit of a binding force. It's going to make it a little bit harder. You're going to get wear and tear there. Or it's going to make it all the way up to the hip. And the hip's going to try to try to do that. So by putting something in there just to take a little bit of it out, so it's compliant. In other words, it will absorb some of that energy and then go mm-hmm. back. It may be better off for the entire mechanism as you go down the road. So that's my prediction is that might be doing something like that there. And again, if they're not, they may want to. And the reason I say that is that I don't work at all for Tesla. I, you know, I, I wish they were having me consult or something like that. But John did say at AI Day that with the analysis we had, a lot of them were, were quote, upset that my guesses were so good. <laughs> so so yeah, I guess they're, I mean, they're careful what they're released to be right now. So a lot of these things were pretty close. Yeah, and um, sounds like you're right because on. the information is there. Yes. You have a unique uh, background I didn't mention because otherwise my intro would have been too long. I didn't mention the yeah. whole section about your background in biomedical uh, engineering and uh, your background there. Yeah. Yep. So here we go. Now let's look at the actual actuator design because remember, if you count this up here, you still have 40 actuators. They started out with 40 in the original design. And they still have 40, yet they end up giving one more to the arm so they could get the wrist. So the arm is no longer six, it's now seven. Mm -hmm. That means they had to sacrifice two of them somewhere. And I think somewhere, someone drew a line in the sand and said, 40 actuators, that's it. You can't have any more. Maybe (laughs) for energy consumption or something else, which meant they had to take it out somewhere. Now, where do they take it out? The cow. I think if the next slide will show, yes, right there. So you can go back and forth between the two to sort of see where they removed it. The neck. The neck. They used to have two degrees of freedom in the neck, and now they don't. Now, why does Optimus have to move its head? Probably doesn't. So it might have a wide enough field of vision. It has more than one eye. It's more like an insect with lots of eyes, right? 
So there's no need for it to do it. So they, they probably said, why do we have them there? And it's because like, we thought we had to. It's like, do you really need them? No, I guess we don't. So the argument was, we don't need it. Let's get rid of it. And the other thing about the slide, hiding in plain sight, was it yeah. said on the feet, force feedback sensing. And I was like, mm -hmm. ah, of course, you know, it's there. I just have to read. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like pictures, you know. So <laughs> the problem is the reading. Yeah. So it's, it's there. They, they're telling us everything. Sure. So the, the neck, I mean, well, yep. they, yeah, okay. Because you were asking like, about that. What about the head? The you know, what about the down, eyes? Right? You can't go left it's and right. Or up and down. It's, it's completely stiff. So it's, it's got, yeah. you know, think of it. It's got a broken neck. And so you, yeah. you've put the collar on there and now you can't move. Yeah. It's, it's going to be very stiff yeah. like this, but it but doesn't it's matter. It's got such a big field of view. And it, yeah. now I think they change it because if you look at, at the original, AI day one, they had a third slide in there where they showed some of the sensors and they showed what almost looked like cameras on the chest. So almost what? like, well, they were going to have cameras. I think they took those off, but originally mm -hmm. it looked like you could actually count the eight cameras like you have on the FSD uh, controller. Exactly. That's what I was they, asking. They like, tried to find placements for them, but yeah. I think they took them off the chest. And, but they probably have enough up in the head that we can get all the movement. And now I don't know if they have like eyeballs that can move and whether that would count as a servo or not, but there's no need. There's no need to move the head. Well, I mean, to nod at me, say yes, yes, sir. Yeah, yes, yeah, I suppose, I suppose. In the first generation, yes, for expression, yes, you would. Wow. But right now for the, the minimum viable product, you do not need it. Okay, that's fine. All right, so now let's talk about applications. Yes. And so this is what Elon said uh, at the investor day, you know, so the rate of improvement here, I think is quite significant. It's obviously not doing parkour. Okay. Yeah. Now it's not so much a dig at, at, um, at Boston Dynamics. It's, it's more or less like everyone was saying, yeah, but you know, Tesla bot can't do this or that. And, um, you know, my reply to that is like, you know, nor should it, because for the application, you don't need to do it. Now, if my house is on fire and Atlas comes to, to save me, I want it to be able to do parkour, no doubt about it, even when he's holding on to me, if that's what it takes. Yeah. But when I'm at a job site and I'm on scaffolding or I'm on the, on the shop floor, I do not want it doing parkour. I mean, that is a fireball offense right there. So there's absolutely no need for it. And my snarky reply has been, I'm not aware of any factory floor positions where doing backflips is part of the job description. Well, maybe figuratively, but never literally. <laughs> Okay. So anyone who's a manager, you know, they were told, oh, I had to do backflips to get that, that line up and running. But you, you don't need that amount of, of capability. All you need is what's enough to get the job done. And so that's sort of my feeling is like, we're looking for jobs that do not require parkour. And, and by the way, um, you can be like a diving coach and a gymnastics coach, and you still don't have to do backflips. You just have to show people how to do it. You have to train them, but you yourself don't actually have to. So again, not that many jobs require you to literally do a backflip. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the next point that I had here was um, that way back in August, I had made this prediction. So this was the, the original mm -hmm. video we kind of looked at. Okay. And it's kind of going back to what Elon said at AI Day 2. You know, we're going to start Optimus with very simple tasks in the factory loading a part into one of, uh, see, one of our more conventional robot cells that welds the body together. In other words, what I call it is feed the kookas at the robot zoo. I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? Yeah. Okay, so the, the kookas are the brand of robot. So they're like a type of animal, like the lions, if you want to think of it that way. And when you go on the shop floor, the robots are always in cages, like at the zoo. Because you have to, you, you can't have the people interacting with the robots. Gotcha. They're going to get in okay. trouble. So right. what you're doing is you're constantly feeding the kookas these pieces of sheet metal, you know, it's like a little slot, you know, almost like feeding a prisoner. So they can work inside the cage. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you have to make sure that, that yeah. there's a lot of safeties and everything to make sure that the operator doesn't get injured accidentally by entering the robot cell. Just like if you had to feed the robots or the lions at the zoo, Mm -hmm. There's all these precautions that you have to go through and how you take the food plate and you slide it in there and you close that slot to make sure they don't come out. So that was sort of my reference is this is what's going on right now on the shop floor anyway. Gotcha. And, and people are doing it just like this. Now, um, if you don't want to take Elon's word for it, and if you don't want to take my word for it, 
take mm -hmm. Milan's word for it. Just listen to this. Right, so hopefully by now you guys got a good idea of what we've been up to over the past few months. Um, we started having something that's usable, but it's far from being useful. There's still a, a long and exciting road ahead of us. Um, I think the first thing within the next few weeks is to get Optimus at least at par with Bumble C, the other bot prototype you saw earlier, and probably beyond. Um, we're also going to start focusing on the real use case at one of our factories, and really going to try to try to uh, uh, nail this down and iron out all the elements needed to deploy this product in the real world. I was mentioning earlier, um, you know, indoor navigation, um, graceful form management, or even servicing, all components needed to uh, scale this product up. But um, I don't know about you, but after seeing what we've shown tonight, I'm pretty sure we can get this done within the next few months or years um, and, uh, and make this product a reality and change the entire economy. Um, so I would like to thank the entire Optimus team for all their hard work over the past few months. I think it's pretty amazing. All of this was done in barely six or eight months. Thank you very much. Wow. Yes, exactly. So I think everyone forgot about that part of the presentation. What's next? Uh, he was very bullish <laughs> that within a matter of weeks after that, they would have the new version of Optimus up and walking and that they already were looking at applications on the floor that you'd be putting in. I mean, look at the time. I mean, that timeline is very accelerated. No one listened close enough to what he said. He said six months in, in months or years to come, but I, he said months. Yes. He didn't say years in to months. come. And, and, the, and the years to come was like, you know, some of these, you know, really advanced kind of applications. Remember, he was talking about a whole suite of different things. But definitely within months, we are going to see it doing something already pretty effective. And then, you know, yeah. years before we have it in the house, folding the laundry, that kind of thing. Right. But it's in clear the that they see the glide path. They're, they're bringing this in. They, they have, have everything in there. So what do you think is the next application? What do you think that's going to be, Herbert? Uh, what do you mean? It's going to be factory for sure. Right, that we're still talking right. factory, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do we have any ideas? Now, when I was there at the, the shareholder meeting and we went out on the floor, you know, get to see a little bit. I wish I could have seen a, a lot more, but they kind of corralled us. There were already some real low hanging fruits out there. And I ended up making another video on, on my website showing one of them had to do with just an operator who's picking up tires that are coming in from different locations and putting them onto the conveyor to go out to make it onto the cars. It's a very simple application, just picking up, moving around. Now it's heavy and it's actually too heavy for the humans to lift it all day. So they have these lift assists, but there's Optimus could do that also. Just kind of go over it, go down, pick it up, group, put it in somewhere else. Somewhere. And right now I could just see that was right. There's like Optimus could do that. That's, that's another piece of low hanging fruit. So there's more and more little operations like that, that you were constantly seeing. Uh, and now I was talking low hanging fruit, low hanging fruit. When I saw the video on investor day, my reaction was, okay, screw the low hanging fruit. Optimus is picking the fruit from the treetops. It's that's <laughs> what we saw that's at good. that point. That's it was, great. so it's able to do a lot more, but still we're good. They're doing some, yeah. or they're getting ready to, or like I say, they, they've at least already proof of concept in some demos. But the question is when they really say, all right, it's doing this now, and yeah. it's going to continue doing that for weeks and weeks and weeks. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's done like a half shift or something here and there, but when it does the full shift in a couple of places, and we can already see, because there was another video, which uh, this one right here, which was a great video uh, that came out of China. And just okay. look at this thing, and you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Low hanging fruit applications. So there's the robots. Now the, that there's a cell back there where the robot has to pay, take up two pieces of sheet metal and put it in the final location to actually be welded. But it needs to be yeah. fed these pieces of sheet metal. So the operator is coming over. He has to wait for the light. He picks up yeah. one from each side because there's a left and a right. And he drops it on there and drops it on there. Not with a whole lot of precision. That's very easy to drop it in place because the pins and everything make sure it's right and the robot's going to pick it up. Now, look what happened right there. Oops, he made a mistake. He went in too quick. He had to reset the safety. He made a mistake. <laughs> now he can go in. Now, in this case, he has to bring in one piece at a time because it's, it's probably too heavy to do one or do two. So he goes back, he picks up another, he comes back. He does that all day long. 
And then you can see like some other sort of simple operations. They just go on and on and on like that throughout the entire factory. So they're, they're constantly feeding these small parts, small parts, small parts, all the way through there. I mean, we're just looking at, I'm not sure they probably put something on that casting. I'm not sure because obviously they didn't lift the casting in there unless they had some sort of lift assist, but it looks like they probably had to do some operation on there. Again, something that Optimus could be doing. There's so many different operations. And when I saw that video, I said, wow. okay, here okay. we go. So that was video we'll that, that, was, that was video that was shared uh, by a Chinese uh, mm -hmm. media company that was allowed to yes. go into the Giga China Giga Shanghai, and they walked and toured, and they showed you real video of what actually yes. is happening in Giga yes. Shanghai as they build these cars, and you were able to find that perfect spot of oh, a there's human. So many. There were so many. Still help. Yes. There's so many, and that's one example where that yeah. could be a bot doing it instead of a human. Yes. and that they wouldn't make the mistakes that the human yeah. made. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Because the the bot would not have walked in and accidentally stopped it. Now. It was able to kind of pick up there. I don't think he, he necessarily stopped the production for a long enough time for it to cause any sort of problem. But those are the kinds of things that because you get fatigued, you do it and you realize, yeah. oh, I have to wait for the, the green light before I go in. And then he had to step back and he had to reset the button. So and then the robot had to clear out and then he was able to go in. But Optimus will be getting, you know, with the Bluetooth or something like that. Oh, you can go in or not uh, when it's time to do that. So. Um, Optimus won't be making that mistake and it will probably be putting it down there. Well, automating the idea of picking up something from a big parts bin like that is not easy, which is why it hasn't been done. I mean, it seems like it should be too easy. You get these two, literally these mm -hmm. big buckets, these big bins is full of these parts and the parts may be stacked together or they may be kind of all over the place and you have to go down and figure out how to pick one of them up. That's very hard for us to automate right now, but Optimus is the perfect design for that. So again, you, that was my example. This is what's going to happen. And, and this, so I guess this is the point I say QED, right? <laughs> it's like, QED. I'm going to prove this. And we've kind of uh -huh. gone right on down here. And we, we've proved my thesis, I think, fairly well that uh -huh. this is going to be one of the first applications in why Optimus is doing it and why we need to have more than a dozen or a hundred robots or Optimus to be able to start to get the training data to start moving ahead. Yeah, so this video, so first of all, you created this animation like a long time ago, right? Yes, like back, back, in the, back in the summer, right right after the uh, shareholder meeting when it was really pretty clear. It's like, okay, I've, I've got to put this thing out. So, and then with Secondly, all the statements and everything, it was obvious. This is pretty poetic because you mm -hmm. got the, uh, I asked you this question at the very beginning of this video. These are the robots that are existing in factories and they need yes. to be put in a cage to protect humans. And then there's, yes. a, there's a humanoid robot that's outside of the cage. <laughs> yes, yes. And what that means is that long-term, depending upon how you set these things up, you won't have to have them so caged if you need to have this kind of interaction. Right. They will still you need to be to. there if you really have to go manual. But if you decide we don't want to go manual, because it, it looked kind of odd to me is that the humans were feeding the robot and the robot was grabbing it and then bringing it over to some other fixtures. So what that is, it's adding a step. Yeah. But what Optimus could do is he could say, forget about putting that in there. Optimus is just going to go right in there with the robots moving around and he's going to put it right That's on it. there. Because gotcha, gotcha. if you go back to that video, you're going to notice that robot is has a, what's called a dual uh, kind of gripper uh, situation where, or uh, two arms or, or uh, two tools on it. One tool for grabbing and the other tool for spot welding. We hate having to design robots to do that, but it was better to do to have one robot do two operations and rather have two robots do separate operations. But you see, it's very complex. Yeah. You have to have this thing that comes down, grabs the part, it's going to bring it over. And then once it gets there, suddenly it flips around and says, oh, now I'm going to do the spot welding task. Mm -hmm. So it has two of them on there. And there's no reason why Optimus couldn't be going straight into the cell now because it's going to be able to do the choreography with the other robots. It understands it. How do they communicate with each other? I mean, that's a dumb question. I know how they're going to do it. but I Oh, mean, the, I mean, the, the uh, Optimus, are you talking about the industrial robots that are out there right now? Optimus to the industrial robots. Um, more than likely, they are going to, it's going to know at any instant where the, uh, the area is free. So they, they've worked a lot on, on robots right now to get the coordination that they will have this um, 
a map. I'm trying to forget what it's called, but you, you have a workspace that you're allowed or zones, they call them zones, where you're able to enter or not. So if my arm enters this zone, you're now excluded. You can't go in. And as soon as I get out of there, now the next one can kind of go in. So they're constantly doing these things to say whether you're allowed to do this, that, or anything else. So you know where the zones of exclusion are, but if you know the choreography, if you know exactly what your dance steps, dance steps have to be, you can dance around that and get there. And that is going to save a lot of floor space and it's going to save a lot of time. Wow. Okay. I love that. So, so you'll be even... able to do things with Optimus that you would not want to do with a person because the person will get hurt. Okay. And then this is like just another example, kind of similar. I, the reason why I want to show this is like, well, what if the part is really heavy? Well, we have really heavy parts already and humans are able to do it. And they do it not because they're super strong, but because they have this lift assist. And I'm not sure, is, is that video running? Yeah, there we go. So, um, so Optimus is so able to go over there, gets a lift assist, oh. picks that up, yeah. brings it on over, feeds the cell. And then you get this turntable that, that brings it around. <laughs> And the other reason that you, you can't allow the humans to go in there is that if you have a welding cell uh, yeah. and you have the arc going on, it's dangerous to be very close. So they have to have all the shielding around there to make sure that your eyes don't get blinded from the, the arc or anything like up. And it doesn't matter. You can walk right in there, walk around. <sighs> now, okay. Now, Herbert, I must say some of these ideas I'm having just yeah. sort of came up now. All right. <laughs> so you helped it. <laughs> <laughs> you help these ideas. Yeah. Yeah, I force uh, you to dig deep and yeah. show me stuff. I, I want to show my yeah. audience stuff that you had yeah. shown people. Yeah. Before. Yeah. So uh, th this now the other day we just talked about how do we teach. Yeah. And you know, this can just be kind of a jumping off point to 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 go to some other things. But they did show that they are using sort of VR or AR kind of capabilities to teach a little bit of the motion that humans would yeah. do for a particular task and then try to carry that over. And so uh, this isn't a video here, but you might remember that, you know, that you see how it's kind of, uh, they're wearing these different kinds of tracking devices. Where did I you get actually this? have some here. So Where's you, you can get, oh, that was also in the AI day too. That was, that was towards yeah. the end uh, sure. where they, they showed uh, how they go ahead and they teach it by tracking human motion. So he's got something like this on his chest. So you can see when he leans forward, leans back, he does the tracking. You have these trackers for the, the hands and the elbows to give you an idea, just, just from that and then using inverse kinematics, you can figure out exactly what the arm is doing and use that to teach Optimus. So that was like the beginning of it. And all I'm showing on the video after this is just some work that I, I did a few years ago doing the same thing of putting trackers on my body and then uh, inside of VR being able to have our kinematic model move around. So all these movements are a result of what I'm wearing on my hands. Gotcha. That's me. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so then go along there and I actually calibrated the room. So here I'm trying to see that when I, I knock on the doors or if I, I knock on the walls, that they really are physically there. So mm -hmm. uh, everything I see is actually there. And then, well, yeah, I can actually do the Rocky push-ups, right? You know? <laughs> so, but you were doing with your hands. You weren't actually yes, the whole Yes. Body. So the whole thing was being able to show, you know, the tracking motion and what's going on there. And that's a tracker that I put on a chair. And that just calibrated the tracker to the chair. That rotation there made nice. that chair now calibrated. And now with that tracker, I actually have inverse kinematics for the chair, if anyone's ever done that before. So just with that tracker, I can infer everything that that chair is doing. So again, that's an example. You don't need to actually know uh, what every single part of that chair is doing. But mm -hmm. with that information, you can figure it out. Just with Matt. So that's the same thing that they're doing uh, with, uh, with Optimus is you don't necessarily need to have a sensor everywhere. If you have enough sensors in the right places, you can infer what's happening, even if you don't have a direct measurement point there. And that's okay. just to give an example of some of the background that I've had of being able to track these things and why I know a little bit about human kinematics, because we've had to do that within our company. You definitely can. So uh, I've yeah. been saying this, uh, we had this discussion, uh, but I still maintain that what you, they've shown us so so far is the body tracking. And they show the if I can do yes. this as human, and then it's teaching the bot what you're supposed to do. So if I pick this up, it can follow me doing it now. It's teaching it how to do it. I still yes. think that, there, that Tesla is creating an AR, AI glasses, AR glasses, mm -hmm. and that humans put the AR glasses on, control the bot, and then you're now seeing whatever the bot's seeing, 
And then as you show the bot, oh, that's the ball, water bottle, and I'm going to grab it. Now the bot knows right. how to do exactly the same movement. Knows how to do that. Yeah. And, and, and so I, I think that just, we talked about it like right now, uh, the uh, robo taxi has a million cars, actually four million cars out there now that mm -hmm. uh, all have cameras on them and they're tracking billions and billions of miles driven and they're teaching the neural mm -hmm. net to learn how to drive a car. How are they going to teach yes. a bot to navigate, you know, the environment? They also need, you know, I don't know, thousands and thousands, thousands of AR glasses so that people, they can feed that video. Or can you just take YouTube videos? Can you just grab that stuff? There, there'll probably be a, a little bit of AR to get it jumped, uh, a jump start on that. Uh, but I think what's going to happen is it's going to be Optimus is doing something and it's stuck and it needs help. So you, you'll throw in some AR and you'll help it through. Now I can show you like a living example already. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're able to go to a particular website, plus one right robotics, now. and you right can bring now. that up. Yes, go ahead right now. Plus one robotics. It's a good friend of mine. Eric Nevis has a company in San Antonio. And um, they kind of have robots as a service in the parcel industry. And when you bring up the website and see it, you will sort of see what they're doing. And they have a picking system, robotic picking system, that uses a camera to be able to figure out what to pick up. Okay. They go out and they just are constant. And so they come in kind of random and they pick it up. And their camera system is really, really good. I mean, it has like 99.999% accuracy on what it needs to do. Now, look at the number up at the top. I think if you scroll up, do, they, do you see a number up at the top? Okay, that was different this morning when I looked at it. Every minute, they are showing you how many picks their robots are, are, have made worldwide. Sure. So they're, okay. they're getting, you know, three quarters of a billion just about there so far. Mm -hmm. They have a nerve center in San Antonio 24-7 that if you take that number and multiply it by 99.999, which seems like a lot of nines, but remember the march of nines, that means every now and then, whether it's every thousand, every 10,000, the robot will get stuck and doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that they get a signal in their nerve center, up, oh, this one over here is stuck. They look at what the robot is seeing, what the problem is, and say that one over there, <laughs> they just point at it on the screen and the robot mm -hmm. goes on its way. Gotcha. So, so it has cameras. That exists and already. Human operator. It, yeah. It has cameras. It has cameras that's able to figure it out. But every now and then it gets stymied because, you know, a couple of parcels come in kind of funny or the coloration's a bit weird. It's at a, an angle. And then, of course, what do you think happens with that data when they're stuck? It's like a CAPTCHA. <laughs> it's used to trade the neural net. So yeah. every time they get that, which means they keep on, you know, they're getting their march or nines. Yeah. So the technology yeah. already exists out there to be able to do these kind of things, these interventions. So I say, that's what's going to happen is they're not going to teach, they're going to teach Optimus enough to bootstrap it. And then it's going to start going. And then we are going to have operators that are going to be sitting in a nurse center and like Optimus 45 over here is having a problem. And you like, you, like you say, you'll bring up maybe these AR glasses to see a little bit of what's going on. And then you'll see what the problem is. And then maybe you'll, you'll actually go ahead and get some handsets and then sort of force Optimus around or maybe just kind of point something out. It's like, this is what we want you to do. And then it will go ahead and correct itself and go. So in many cases, you don't actually have to physically go on the floor. Now, a lot of times when this is happening today, and, and this is what Plus One has sort of figured out, is that whenever there was that problem, like someone gets a beeper that goes off or their cell starts vibrating and the manager looks like, oh, no. And then he's got like, get on the bike or whatever and run on down there, do a couple of things, do a reset to get the robot to get going. The idea is like a lot of these interventions, you don't need to actually physically be there. You can go ahead and correct it. Now it's one thing if there's like a hardware fault or something else, but a lot of times it's just like, oh, uh, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. Make the decision for me. And then you get in there. So the telepresence is going to help a lot. So that's going to speed up definitely everything right there. All right. My gosh, that was a lot you shared with me today. Let's get yeah. to the uh, yeah. To yeah. The we can finish it off with this. Yeah, you might want to can you make the view money. bigger so we can kind of look at that. Now, um, let's take a look at this. So, right now, if just take an example that if you have a, a worker on the floor and you're you're quote paying them twenty five dollars, remember twenty five dollars is what they believe you are paying them, and of course they realize that at the end of the day they're getting twenty dollars an hour because of of taxes and other things. 
but the manager, or let's say the, the, um, the boss is, no, you're not costing me $25. You're costing me at least $30 an hour because I have these other things called FICA taxes and everything else. Plus mm. there's like these overhead charges that could be anywhere from 25 to 40% for the facilities that's there. You know, break rooms, bathrooms, parking spaces, you know, a locker, software you might need. I mean, all these other things that are, are part of the cost of having an employee. And so if you just kind of look at it right now, uh, $25 and 40 hours a week and working one shift for 52, that person costs you nearly $70,000 a year. Yeah, for sure. But now you have, let's say, a factory that does two shifts. Go ahead and put two shifts in there. So we change that to two shifts. Oh, it's interactive. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's interactive. Go ahead. Yeah, that's, you can go ahead and make that two. Hold on, hold on. I got to. How come I can't control this? There you go. Okay. Should. Oh, we're getting a two? Okay, you should just be able to double click and type two? I know. Uh, it's not locked, is it? I don't know. Yeah, it's locked. I th I'm only How a view only. Locked? Oh, you don't yeah. want to view? Okay, maybe that's what it is. Okay, I was going to say. You, you've used a spreadsheet that. before. Of okay. course. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's you view have. only. You don't see that view only, okay? I yeah. request it sent to you. I request you. We... No problem. Oh, am I the problem? I, I, I oh, I just sent it to you and it, it didn't. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So this is okay. this is what happens. We didn't test this ahead I, of time. We'll multiply by two. Come on. Yeah, uh, we can multiply get... by two, but but don't forget overtime. So if you put in like 10 hours of overtime, well, then happen. That's time and a half. And you put all that stuff in there. And so if you have like two workers, you know, you know, workers with two shifts working 40 hours, and let's say they on average have an extra 10 hours of overtime a week suddenly you're looking at over $200,000 a year Easy. in the salaries yeah. for that. Yeah. Now yeah. that means you would be willing to pay close to that for an Optimus. Mm -hmm. Or if it's half of that, how much does it cost mm -hmm. to build an Optimus? Well, right now it's probably pretty expensive, but once they start cranking them out, it's going to be less than a Model 3 because it's less complex than a Model 3. And a bot can basically do the entire build of another bot. There's no need for other things. Um, oh, yeah. It's it's simplicity. If, if you look at the parts list and everything, and a lot of people have estimated it's going to be around $10,000. And I can believe that if you look at the parts list. Once you've got the problem solved and you're getting them out there, they could be pretty cheap, which means this is going to be a huge moneymaker. Now, Tesla will not sell the Tesla bot. I, I totally agree. I've already been saying that myself. It, it just doesn't they, make sense. It, Subscription, you know, they may eventually, at first they do not want to because they need the data and they need to be in control. They want to make sure that the right people are using it and they're using it for the right applications. So there's going to be all these disclaimers, you know, you can use it, but if you're using it for these kind of unethical applications, no way, we're not going to give it to you. So they will always have the right to be able to bring it back and they will get all that data. And the thing is they will be able to hire them out and make a ton of money. Absolutely. Because... If you're talking about a cost of $10,000 and then you could potentially 50, 60, I mean, how much are they going to charge? It could be huge. I mean, you could put three shifts in there and now suddenly we're talking like closer to $300,000. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It's almost like uh, what Amazon does. You know, Amazon is an mm -hmm. e-commerce site. They sell their own products and then they go, hey, mm -hmm. you're, a, you're a, uh, a small business. Let me sell your product. Then what they did do, they just end up selling the same product. They, they pick the ones that work well. Yes. Why would Tesla have to sell this to other companies? If you're a company that makes, I don't know, I don't know, makes, makes a toy. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can say, I'll Again, make the toy. It, it's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the example. That's how a lot of these other companies work. Um, in the case of Plus One, I'm not sure if they actually sell the cells to their end customers or if they kind of set them up and then operate it. But I know there are situations like that where rather than someone buying a robotic cell from someone, the integrator puts it in there and it's kind of in a leasing kind of thing. And they say, you guys just run it. We want you to operate it. Now I know they're at least operating to kind of keep it going as, as that kind of service, but potentially it's just going to be the same thing is that they don't want to have anyone training it. You let the Tesla employees come in and go ahead and, and, and run it. And, and that's how it will work. And so, yeah, my bull case, I mean, it's uh, end of this year. I know Randy Kirk thinks there's going to be a thousand for sure. He's sticking to it. He's been trying to pull me over to, to his side. And I was like, well, I'm not sure they're going to scale up to a thousand. They could. There's no reason why not. I'm just 
hedging my bets, I guess, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, I've, had, I've interviewed Randy a few times and he's made that uh, guess. Mm -hmm. The the cool thing about you and Randy and the others is that you're going the complete opposite of what the vast majority of experts were saying. Don't get too excited. You know, Tesla takes a long time when they said the roadster yeah. is going to come or the semi is going to come or the Cybertruck is going to come. It's a lot longer than we realize. It takes time. And that this is a bot. The bot is a lot more difficult than people realize. Now, having said that, six months ago, six months later, they had something and people were like, you know, oh, it doesn't really move much. It can't really move. It doesn't do parkour. Can't, like the boss. Yeah, it doesn't do. But, but let's remember. Yeah. We're not talking about Tesla making money by selling the robots. A penny saved is a penny earned. Yeah. Do I have to say that again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A penny yeah, saved I mean, is yeah. a penny earned. Yeah, they yeah. are the user. They have an internal user and they will yeah. save money with a Tesla bot. Yeah. So think about that yeah. operator who was loading those pieces of yeah. sheet metal. That yeah. operator is costing what? Well, in China, I know the wages are different, but in the US, potentially yeah. 50, you know, the $70,000 to do that. You've got two shifts. Yeah. That's 140. You put Tesla bot there. Yeah. You've just saved $200,000 in that one cell and go to the next one. The next and one, you're the saying next that one. they need 500 at least by the end of the year because they need that that learning, that they, enough. They, enough they, need the, they need the learning. And there, there yeah. may be enough. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to see if there's that much low hanging fruit out there. But the thing is, they may be able to go more than just a low, like I say, they're. The low-hanging fruit I've been talking about is the fruit that's on the ground already rotting. That's what that application yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. So with that they've got covered. Now they're, they literally are picking the fruits that are hanging down low. That's going to be the next one. And then they'll be able to go a little bit higher. So they are going to save absolute boatload of money there. And just think about what that does to your margins. Yeah. Um. Yeah, this is good. I'm getting excited now. I, might, I just don't want to get excited. <laughs> That's the problem. But yeah, what's yeah. beautiful, what you showed me today and the audience here is that, uh, you know, you really do believe that they are not just using uh, visual effects, that this no. isn't just a Absolutely graphic not. design. You guys, you guys spend an episode, you guys are experts, uh, John Gibbs and you are experts mm -hmm. in uh, graphic design. He basically, as a, somebody who spent his entire career looking at this, said that this is not just, a, just some sort of not. Like a, yeah, is that it? Um, CGI. But and then what's cool is that you've pieced things together by showing photos in the past that turned into reality of the video. Mm -hmm. So you're basically saying I don't think that those videos again were staged. They're they look like they're, they're not staged. Real it, every, yeah. every, everything fits in. Everything absolutely makes sense in what they're doing. And I think the yeah. other point I want to make out is, is there are other companies that are making humanoid robots, yeah. but none of them actually need them. Right. So right now they're being funded by investors or venture capital and they don't have any cash flow yet. They're not right. safe. They can't use them internally for anything. They need an external user. And it's going to be a while before they get that. Right now, Tesla can justify all this because just think about it. If yeah. each one of those robots is saving you just say $100,000 a year in wages right. and you multiply that by 500, what is, see, what is, is that 50 million? Is that right? <laughs> I need my spreadsheet. Give me access to the spreadsheet again. Get, get me access to the spreadsheet. But I mean, think about it. It's like, okay, we can take $50 million and throw it into R&D. And, yeah, yeah. and it doesn't, I mean, it's a wash and at that point. They're yeah, not losing they are, money by doing this. They're already they are saving money. They already make many, many parts already today for the cars. They make their own yes. cars for gosh darn sakes. Yes. So yes. they know how to create these actuators. They know how to create the, every single part, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And they're so they know it. So it's like this flywheel, right? The manufacturer, then you create the bot that manufactures, and then you make the, they make the bot that manufactures the bot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just it just goes on and on. And then again, the floor space. I mean, the, all, all this floor space they have is so the people can move through it, is that and true? all the safety equipment. Oh yeah, That's I mean, think about it. All the offsets you have to have. You know the yeah. um, you know whenever you have any, any sort of operations like welding and everything, you have to have adequate ventilation. So again, when you look at a cell, everyone's assumes the most expensive part of the cell is the robot. And it's like, it's not. The safety fencing probably costs more than the robot. And then everything else you have to do with the PLCs that are tying it up. The end of arm tooling, the end of arm tooling typically is bespoke 
And that costs a lot of money to come up and get going working around. And then you've got the fixtures and the jigs and everything else that's holding it in, the stuff that's got to bring it in there. And then again, if you've got to ventilate it, all those things, those cells cost a lot of money to put together. The robot's not much. But if you can start eliminating some of that stuff, it's just going to drive the cost down. And again, the whole idea of production density, that's what Lars was talking about. The idea that they want to be able to have more work being done in a smaller area, in a smaller right. volume. Just, yeah, Elon's another. complained about that. He says 3% of the volume of the factory is where manufacturing has. The rest of it, 97%, nothing is happening. We want to make it like an integrated oh, circuit there. with yeah. you know stuff going on everywhere. And that's yeah. one way to populate it, to increase the density, is now optimists can do things that people are forbidden to do based on OSHA regulations and everything else. And it's okay, low I'm hanging fruit. Excited. Maybe by next yeah, year. Me we'll too. See. You know what? It's like I convinced myself even more on this talk. So thanks a lot, <laughs> Robert. It's, it's been great. Absolutely You're been great. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Scott. You did make us all brighter. This was a very exciting conversation. You showed photos and videos and you convinced us exactly what it works. You definitely know what you're talking about. Everyone, you know, you can follow Scott on his Twitter handle, Going Ballistic 5 a and D. Mm -hmm. why, why is that Go, going ballistic five and this should be just, should just be uh going ballistic five should be it I okay think. going ballistic yep. five and he has a youtube video so a lot of the, the animation you saw he has that in his youtube videos yeah. you got to check him it's, out going ballistic as well going ballistic five as well yep it's Thank it's mainly so a repository of my videos it's not like i post all the time i'm not trying to put you and john and everyone else out of business <laughs> I'm not trying to be a competitor. <laughs> it's just like, oh, <laughs> okay, every now and then when I feel like it. So I think like I might have like 500 views. It's like the highest video out there or right. something like that. It's, so. not, it's not like you're trying to check it, but it's pretty interesting it's, information that nobody, just, Yes, it's very relevant at this point and your background's good. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully you did mm -hmm. get brighter. Please give us a like and subscribe mm -hmm. and uh, tell us uh, what you thought today. You know, write in the comments and uh, Scott, if you don't mind, come into the comments and reply to people. I think they'd love to be able to ask you questions and you answer. <laughs> be be, if be you careful because if, if you go to my, my Twitter site, there's a lot of snark there. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, you're funny. You're very so, funny. I love it. Okay. So Thanks, everybody. I'll Thank hold you. off on the video on the comments on, on what I say. I'll try to be nice. <laughs>